Your Coca-Cola bottler presents Claudia, based on the famous play and novels by Rose Franken. Brought to you transcribed Monday through Friday by your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. Relax, and while you're listening, refresh yourself. Have a Coke. And now, Claudia. What are you doing? Hmm? I said, what are you doing? Reading. People send the silliest books to their friends in the hospital. Oh, you're reading. Oh, I'm reading. You didn't watch me dangle. I watched you the other day. You've got feet that dingle, dangle, dingle. Tingle. <laughs> but you didn't watch me today. You know, I don't think you're taking me very seriously. I watched you today out of the corner of my eye. You're supposed to be over dangling, you I know. I said tingle. My foot went to sleep. I wasn't really dangling. I didn't think it was a first-rate performance. Oh. That's why I didn't give it my undivided attention. <laughs> Say, did I tell you what Mrs. Fegan said this morning? Hmm? You know, I don't think you are paying much attention. Oh, oh. I said, did I tell you what Mrs. Fegan said this morning? Mrs. Fegan? Who, who's Mrs. Fegan? Mrs. Fegan is the cleaning lady who does this room up every single morning. Oh, that Mrs. Fegan. Then you know what she said. Darling, I didn't know there was a Mrs. Fegan, so how could I know what she said? You are the most difficult man in the world to pay a compliment to. <laughs> now I am utterly confused. What is this all about? It's the trade last. A what? A trade last. Oh. You tell me something nice about me and I'll tell you what Mrs. Fegan said. This sounds like a racket. Extortion, that's what it is. <laughs> what did Mrs. Fegan say? Last, last, last. She did. What a very profound observation. <laughs> <Scoop>. <laughs> you give me a compliment first. Or I'll never tell you what Mrs. Fegan said. Your tongue could be hanging out. Well, no, really. Oh, yes. Yeah. The chief floor nurse... Yes? ...told me yesterday mm -hmm. that in all of her 35 years' experience in the hospital, mm -hmm. she had never, but never known any woman to be so remarkable... She did. ...so efficient in the business of having a baby. She did. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess I just have a nap for it. Now, don't you think that you'd better dangle some more? Why? Well, I just did. Well, your leg must have gone to sleep again. Hmm? I just pulled it. Almost pulled it off, and you didn't seem to be aware of it. Oh, you. <laughs> and the nurse didn't say those things. Ah. For that, I won't tell you what Mrs. Fegan said about you. Well, if the nurse didn't say it, I did. I'm the fellow you get your best compliments from anyway. Mm -hmm. All right. Now my tongue is hanging out. Well, Mrs. Fegan said, what a brave bundle of a baby he was to live in spit of his fine, handsome daddy with no. a fist on him and a set to his jaw that would set the world rocking one of these days. No. Just like his fine, good-looking daddy. She said that. That she did, she did. Well, then you didn't dangle before she came in. You dangled after she left. Yes, why? Because she was pulling your leg. Mrs. Fegan, you can tell her from David O'Shaughnessy Norton, not only kissed the Blarney Stone when she was a wee bit of a lass, but she bit off a piece of it, too. Mrs. Fegan has never seen this fine, handsome husband of yours, and as for our offspring being the living spit of me, that is an ill-chosen simile. <laughs> that is rank defamation and libel. What is? Well, he hasn't hardly any hair at all. He looks like he's been left out in the sun and parboiled. He makes the most outrageous faces and... Go on. And he's forever blowing bubbles. Now, if that's a portrait of me, one or the other of us is being liable. Pretty bubbles. I think you're unjust. He's a beautiful baby. Mm, of course, he's a beautiful baby. Did I say he wasn't? Well... But I don't think he's a spitting or any other kind of image of a 30-year-old man. I will tell him what you said and he won't. Speak to you he doesn't again. speak to me now. He just blows bubbles. Pretty bubbles. When he gets them out over his chin, they're pretty. <laughs> well, he does most of the time. He's a very dry baby. Oh, darling, don't be silly. There is no such thing as a dry baby. A dry baby is an anachronism, a self-contradiction, an impossibility. Well, as babies go, he, he goes is. on and on like Tennyson's Brook. <laughs> Vegan. Vegan. What about Mrs. Fegan? Nothing about Mrs. Fegan. It's just the name. It slipped my memory. You know how it is when something escapes your memory? It stands around and bothers you for days. Where was that magazine I was looking at yesterday? It's under that pile on the lower... No, the lower shelf of the table. Oh, here we are. I, I'd like to write this editor a letter. He's a bad journalist. You don't tell the story of a boy cutting down a 
cherry tree and not mention the name of George Washington. What in the world are you talking about? Began. Well, I don't get it, darling. Mm, the world has a short memory. Here it is, the, the Jarvis Bay right here. Mm. They even have a picture of it, and they don't mention the name of a man who did it. Did what? Flung an answer in the teeth of a power-hungry nation and let them know that one single freeborn man could declare personal war upon evil. Jarvis Bay, Jarvis Bay. The Jarvis Bay was a dirty little tramp cargo vessel. And? She slam-banged around the world carrying pig iron and tin pans and clothes pens. Sounds and... like a floating department store. <laughs> she, she was, sort of. <laughs> oh, yes. I forgot to mention it. Part of her cargo was heroes. Heroes? Mm -hmm. Cargo? I don't get it. Yes, heroes. As in courage. Go on. Some mad men ran amok and war swept over the world. And the free people of the world were caught unaware and unprepared. And the free flow of the things they needed to live by became just a, a, a trickle. Even that dried up as submarines prowled the oceans and, and the enemy cruisers harried the sea. But the Navy? No, oh, there wasn't enough Navy to go around for all the oceans of the world. And the losses? Were terrific. By the tens of hundreds, ships and their cargoes and their men were sunk and lost. I remember they armed them, didn't they? Yes, when they dug up a few guns to spare, they armed them. They put guns on them and sent them out, but it was it was like giving a, a boy a slingshot to go out and attack a machine gun. There was a boy named David who went forth with a slingshot. Miracles are memorable. You remember David's name, but the editor of this magazine he had a short memory for names. There. There's a picture of the Jarvis Bay. Look at it. Those few glittering hours. Title they've put with it. Does your blood ring? Those few glittering deadly hours of action which rivet the eyes of all the world. It all started prosaically. Thirty-three ships assembled in a harbor and then the order to adventure without escort into the North Atlantic, where a, a German battleship harried the sea lanes and U-boats lurked beneath. There were too many prayers on men's lips in those days for all of them to be answered. On that, that November day in 1940, a, a German sea raider came coursing up over the horizon toward them. What happened? Well, the ships started to disperse in, in all directions to run for it. According to plan. But what happened next, no man had ever dared to plan or dream. You know, nothing can live within the withering firepower of a battleship. And the first shell struck them. A shell fragment tore through the wheelhouse. A man was killed. Where the captain's right arm hung, there was nothing few shreds of flesh that had been ripped off. Makes me sick in the pit of my stomach to think about it. The captain finally gave the order to turn his ship. The only thing he could do. That was what he thought. The only thing he could do, and he gave the order to turn toward the battleship and attack. Attack? One glittering hour that riveted the eyes of all the world. What happened? What could only happen? This, uh, this really occurred. It, it isn't out of a storybook. Mm -hmm. The Jarvis Bay was sunk. And it was all... And nothing... Oh, yes. A great deal was accomplished. Souls like the captain of the Jarvis Bay and his men are, are not easily quenched. Thirty-two ships escaped over the horizon and out into the night to live and to bear their cargoes before the Jarvis Bay went down. And they didn't die in vain. Yeah. Dying isn't an easy business, no matter how good the reason. No, they didn't die in vain. That night, the world tightened its belt. The odds were heavy, and it would be a long war. 
But evil cannot survive so long as the soul of a single man will not be conquered. That night, a little man with a, a mad glint in his eyes covered his silly mustache to still the nervous twitch that worked there as he pondered, pondered. What breed of men are these who could love freedom so? You talk as if the sinking of this one ship marked a turning point in the war. It was one of them. History, for so immense a thing, can turn on so small a point. The men who went down on the Jarvis Bay and men like them made it possible for, for us to continue to live in freedom, to bear the sun we've, we've just had in a democracy of free men. To know a respite in peace in the long struggle against oppression and evil. We owe these men too much, far too much, to allow their deeds and their names to slip away forgotten. Turn to uh, page two in that magazine. There's a picture of a movie actress and her six husband. Now, the editor... The editor forgot to mention the name of the captain of the Jarvis Bay. But he didn't forget to spell out her six married names. No, look, they're all right there. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's a case of cockeyed values. What was the name of the captain of the Jarvis Bay, David? Fagan. No relation, I imagine, of your Mrs. Fagan. Though she should be proud to share his name. Fogarty Fagan. Sounds like battle cry. Battle cry? It, it was just that. It was a battle cry. Fogarty Fagan. Captain Fogarty Fagan of the Jarvis Bay. It's a name to remember. When the working folks of the family discuss the office or plant or shop where they spend eight hours a day... You'll probably hear them mention the Coke cooler every once in a while. Those friendly coolers have become a standby because they enable people to work refreshed. Why shouldn't you work refreshed at home? All you have to do is keep plenty of Coca-Cola on ice. Then you can reach for an ice-cold bottle after you've had a strenuous hour or two of housework. It's a mighty sensible idea. Try it. Say, Joe, tell me, do you ever take your children walking? Oh, surely I do. Well, tell me. How soon after they were born did you start? Almost immediately. You uh, took them out walking in a, uh, what do you call that thing? A, oh, a perambulator. Oh, perambulator. You don't say. And you'd better practice on pushing one of those things, too, David. It's not quite as easy as it looks. Oh, now go on, Joe. Go on. It's a cinch, I know. All right. All right. You can tell me tomorrow if it's a cinch. Tomorrow? Yes, because, uh, David, that's when you'll find out. See you then. So long, Joe. Every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you transcribed with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again tomorrow at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. And remember, whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may be, when you think of refreshment, think of Coca-Cola. For Coca-Cola makes any pause... The pause that refreshes. An ice-cold Coca-Cola is everywhere. This broadcast of Claudia was supervised and directed by William Brown Maloney. And now, here's a word from your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. <laughs>